This year, TYT has been making a lot of moves. Now you can too. Now how are you going to do that? You want to launch a new business? That sounds fun. You're going to change careers. Jesus and Lord mercy. You're going to need a website for all that. Lucky for you, Squarespace also making moves. You're going to go to squarespace.com slash TYT. You're going to get 10% off your first purchase. And you're going to get to build anything you want on that website with a unique domain. What are you, crazy? Go do it now. Go. Hey, TYT. I'm Nomi Konst. We have a special guest today. If you haven't noticed, the world is melting down. What is going on with the economy? What is going on with government? The government is shut down. Wall Street is in chaos. Unemployment, as Brookings has said, is more likely at 14% rather than 4%. Income inequality is worse than it's been since the 20s. Debt is up. The deficit is up. Do we need to change how we look at the economy? and completely flip it over? Well, our next guest for today is uh, the expert on this. Her name is Stephanie Kelton. She's an American economist, professor of public policy and economics at Stony Brook University. She was formerly professor of economics at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. She was the chief economist to the U.S. Senate Budget Committee in 2015 for the Democrats. And you may remember her on the trail as an economic advisor to Bernie Sanders during his presidential campaign. And she's also a fellow at the Sanders Institute. Stephanie, I could go on about your background for much longer. Uh, you're a very accomplished woman and um, you're one of the leaders about, MM, you know, about MMT. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk with us today. Well, thank you for taking time to have me. So, I mean, let's just start off. Do we need to change the way we, we look at the economy? Yeah, in a lot of ways we do. Uh, you hit on some of the big things. I mean, di disagreements about everything from where full employment is, whether the U.S. economy is at full employment, what is our potential GDP, are we out of room, is there room to grow more, how do we think about the role of deficits and debt in the economy. I could go on and on, but there are some pretty fundamental concepts in economics that I think a lot of people get confused and it leads to not just, you know, bad understanding, but also bad economic policy. Is, you know, is the United States unique in that you have literally different parties and within the parties, different factions who view the economy differently? No, I don't think it is. Um, you know, if we just take one example and you look at the UK, uh, you see similar sorts of fights going on, and it almost goes back, you almost just go back to Reagan and Thatcher and then just carry the arguments forward. And that dichotomy uh, just sort of continues on very loosely, uh, a sort of fundamental belief in the ability of markets to correct everything on their own. So a, a laissez-faire, leave it alone, small government, um, trust in markets, deregulate, um, tax cuts as the main driver of economic growth, sort of the supply side trickle down on the one hand, mm -hmm. and then those that still believe that there is a role for government to play, and perhaps a very important role for government to play in the economy, both in um, stabilizing really unstable markets and also creating you know, opportunities, working in partnership with business so that um, you know, the engine of growth continues and government is a part of that. So, uh, you know, you're, you're one of the backers of MMT. Can you explain what this is to, you know, basic understanding, we're not economists yeah. here, <laughs> yeah. what it means? So MMT is just sort of think of it as a brand name uh, for a school of thought in economics, because there are all these different competing schools of thought. Anybody who's ever taken maybe one course in economics has learned about the Keynesians and maybe they know something about the Austrian school because they've heard of Hayek before and they know that Marx was important at some point and Smith. So there are all these competing schools of thought. And MMT is just one among an array of uh, schools of thought or approaches to doing economics. But the basic insight for um, the school of thought that's been dubbed MMT is that um, the countries like the US, like the UK, like Canada, Australia, those, those countries that operate with their own, we could say, sovereign currency, that is, they don't have a currency that's tethered to gold or anything else that's finite, any other country's currency, um, they have a degree of freedom when it comes to using their fiscal and monetary policies, their central banks and their parliament or their Congress, and that their governments are able to do things that other countries that don't have these sovereign currencies can't do. And when we fail to recognize that, we start talking about government as being like a household or like a business or running out of money or being unable to afford certain things. And so that's really kind of the key starting point with MMT is recognizing that the federal government in the United States is not 
revenue constrained like a household or a business. And so the rules of the game are just very different. Once you make that that basic uh, recognition, then everything else sort of follows from there. Why do you think that uh, the folks who are on Capitol Hill who complain that there's not enough money for Medicare for all or, or for free college or any of these social programs, why do you think that they can't acknowledge that there are no constraints? Mm, I think they're afraid of um, what it might mean if they say, okay, it's not about affordability. It's, a, it's about political will. And I think they're afraid uh, of voters and what voters might demand if politicians were to, to sort of be candid with them and say, actually, when we draw up a budget, uh, it's up to us to decide where and how many resources to put in. And if we really want to put more resources into education or infrastructure or social security, we can do that. Mm-hmm. So it sort of gives them political cover to be able to say, to treat things as if we are on a gold standard and that money is scarce and finite and that you can run out of it and there's only so much of it. And then you get comments like, you know, the kind that Obama made, quite frankly, when he talked about shared sacrifice and tightening the belts and, you know, um, that's sort of a language. So it, it provides a little bit of cover for policymakers who I think are a little bit worried about exactly how much the public might demand of their government if they understood that a lot more is affordable than they're told. So correct me if I'm wrong, just to make this very clear. Our monetary system, our currency, is essentially a social construct. Right. I mean, I think we kind of have to take that in for a second. (laughs) So, well, look, let's maybe if I, I sometimes do this with audiences, and most of my audiences are really conservative. There are a lot of them, a lot of times I speak to big audiences in the finance community, and these are people who, you know, their livelihoods are made by telling their clients to spend less, save more, and pay off your debt. And that's great advice for the people whose money they manage, and that's good advice for their clients. But they think that that carries over to the economy as a whole. So they think that what they tell their clients is good is also good for the federal government and, and so forth. So sometimes I'll tell my audiences, you know, don't take it from Kelton. Mm-hmm. Let's take let's hear what Alan Greenspan has mm-hmm. to say. So then that way it's not me trying to persuade them of something. I'm putting up, you know, an authority, the former uh, chair of the Federal Reserve, and I show a little video clip. And it's Alan Greenspan under oath sitting with Congressman Paul Ryan. Wow. And Paul Ryan is pressing Greenspan on this question of Social Security and its affordability. And he's saying, don't you agree with me, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you know Social Security is going broke. We can't afford it the way it's set up today. Now is the time to begin to move toward a system of personal retirement accounts. He keeps saying personal retirement accounts. You and I know what he means. He means privatizing Social Security. And he's trying to reel Greenspan in by saying, don't you agree that the system is unaffordable? We can't keep it up. We've got to change things. So having personal retirement accounts is is another way of making a a future retiree benefits more secure for their retirement. And also, do you believe that personal retirement accounts as a component to a system of solvency does help improve solvency? Because when you have a personal retirement account policy, it's accompanied with a benefit offset with that feature in place, do you believe that personal retirement accounts can help us achieve solvency for the system and make those future retiree benefits more secure? Well, I, w- I wouldn't say that the uh, pay-as-you-go benefits are insecure in the sense that uh, <clears throat> there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. The question is, how do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created which those benefits are employed to purchase. So it's not a question of security. It's a question of the structure of a financial system which assures that the real resources are created for retirement as distinct from the cash. The cash itself is nice to have, but Mm. Uh, it's got to be in the context of the real resources being created at the time those benefits are paid so that you can purchase real resources with the benefits, which, of course, are cash. Mm -hmm. And to Greenspan's credit, he leans into the microphone and he tells the truth. And he's under oath, 
And he says, and I'll quote Greenspan here because I've done, I've seen this video so many times I can do it by heart. He says, I wouldn't say that there's anything unsustainable with the way the system is set up today. There's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to someone. Oh, <gasps> whoa, right? So he's taken, and, and, and you got to see the video because Paul Ryan's face just goes, <laughs> I mean, the color just washes right out. And, and so Greenspan has taken the affordability question off the table. It's not about the money, he says. And then he goes on to make what's the really important point. He says, the question is, how do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created, that those benefits are employed to purchase? And what he's trying to say in his Greenspan way is that we have demographic changes taking place in the U.S. And we have had them taking place for decades. Mm -hmm. Boomers are moving out of the workforce and into retirement in large numbers. They're going to stop paying into the Social Security system, but you know, they're, they're owed uh, benefits when they retire. The question Greenspan is pointing to is, how can we make sure that when, we, when they leave the workforce and we have fewer and fewer workers left behind to produce the stuff, mm -hmm. that we're able to safely send out those benefit checks to future retirees, their dependents and the disabled, and they will be able to spend that money into an economy that is productive enough that you don't get an inflation problem. Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom line. When it comes down to all of these questions about whether deficits are too big, whether the debt is a, a danger or something, it always comes back to inflation. And that's what Greenspan was trying to say. There's nothing to prevent us from making the payments. We owe dollars. Where else could the U.S. dollar come from? The U.S. government has a has a monopoly, right? right? It, only the United States government can issue the U.S. dollar. So if the government has payments due in U.S. dollars, whether they're to you know, Social Security retirees or bondholders or any vendor, anybody else, if they owe dollars, they can always pay the dollars. That was Greenspan's point. The question is, will it drive up inflation? So will it? Well, it depends on whether you're spending more money into an economy that can't catch up. In other words, that's what some economists are talking about today with the, the 1.5 trillion in tax cuts and now the additional 300 billion or so in the spending deal that was uh, agreed by you know, uh, both parties the other day and signed by President Trump. So some economists are saying, is it too much, quote, stimulus? Will it overheat the economy? Will it lead to inflation? And if it does, then the expectation is that the Fed will respond by raising interest rates, and that could either slow things down or perhaps even push the economy into recession. If rates go up, uh, you, you might see something like that happen. So the answer to your question, will it cause inflation, is always it depends how much slack there is in the economy. If there are enough unemployed people and enough capacity in our factories and the economy can absorb that extra demand mm -hmm. by ramping up production, it won't be inflationary. Taking this into account with um, Donald Trump and his sort of view of, of our economy today, um, you know, he's always bringing up China and, mm -hmm. and he, you know, China's our enemy and China's, well, got us here, they took our jobs and we owe them money and blah, blah, blah. How, how much of a factor are, are are the countries that we are indebted to, like China and, and some of the other. Yeah, countries. so people raise this question all the time. And you're right, Donald Trump says, you know, we owe China a trillion dollars or we owe Japan a trillion dollars. They're killing us, they're killing us because, you know, we, we owe them all this money. I remember one night um, during the debates, during the primary, right? I'm sitting there in, in bed with my son who was nine, I think at the time, maybe 10. Anyway, we're watching the Republican primaries and Donald Trump is on one of these rants where he's talking about how these China's killing us and the Japanese are killing us. And he says, they're, they're sending us all these cars and, and what do we get? And my son looks at me and he goes, the cars. cars. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's right, right? We get the cars. So, so that's the, the part about trade. These countries have dollars mm -hmm. because they make and ship us more stuff then we make and ship them. In other words, we run trade deficits with these countries. So we get the stuff and they get the dollars. And what that means is they basically have a checking account at the Federal Reserve as a result of their trade surpluses. So what they do is they take their checking account at the, at the bank, our Federal Reserve, and they say, I don't really want to hold the checking account. I would prefer to hold a savings account. Mm -hmm. And so they take their money and they buy U.S. Treasuries. And that's part of the national debt. And that's what gets people anxious. And they say, China owns part of the national debt, or we owe Japan part of the national debt. Okay, this is true. But what, what happens as a result of them owning those treasuries? 
So the the government in the United States pays China uh, some dollars and they get interest on the bonds that they hold, just like any other bondholder. And so they're accumulating a little bit of interest income. And what do they do? They turn around and roll it over into another U.S. Treasury. Meanwhile, all the stuff is coming our direction. We're getting real goods and services at a price. Let's be honest. It's cheaper than if we produced it ourselves. So it does help the U.S. consumer's dollar go further in terms of purchasing power because you can buy more because you have access to cheap imports. The trick, as you pointed out in, in the start of your question, is that the jobs piece. Mm -hmm. If if the manufacturing is taking place there instead of here, and we're allowing that to create unemployment domestically, that's where trade becomes a problem. I want to get back to that uh, at, at, in, a, in a couple of minutes, but um, you know, I, I ran into a, a former hedge fund, a, a very well-known hedge fund guy, um, without giving away his identity. He said something to me, and he said, he, he was talking about the economy, he doesn't understand why I backed Bernie Sanders, doesn't understand our view of economics. And he looks at me, he goes, you know, I just think by the time 2020 happens, people are just going to feel like the economy is better. And he said, well, but, but they don't, and they don't now, and they didn't during Obama, and, and clearly there was a retaliation. He goes, no, but it's just getting better. And this is before the stock market crash, to be fair. Mm -hmm. I said, well, this, is all, this seems to be based on your view of what the economy is. You know, the economy to you might feel better because you're able to take out money from wherever. You, you're liquid or you, have, uh, you can you know, take out loans. But to the average person, it doesn't feel better because even if they have a job, they're not able to, you know, to get access to the same type of uh, finances that you are. But fundamentally, I just couldn't understand how he couldn't see it. And so I guess yeah. my question is, what you're describing with MMT, to me, it seems logical and it actually works in favor of a lot of Wall Street executives, but, and, and maybe even you know Republicans, if they're concerned with the deficit and if they're concerned with spending, um, if they have this basic understanding that, uh, of the economy the way that you look at it. Why do you think they're unable to switch their, their, their brains and kind of open it up a little bit and, and see things through this lens? I mean, I think that people, we could look at what Republicans have done, both with the tax cuts and with the $300 billion or so in spending and say, they seem to kind of get MMT, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you could make that argument. Now, this is not how my colleagues and I, the scholars that have produced the literature that's now known as MMT. These are not the policies that we would have implemented, but it is the case that, you know, it's expansionary fiscal policy. They're cutting taxes and increasing government spending, and they're hoping that they're doing it in such a way that they're going to generate 3% growth. That's their target, right? That's the number that the White House and the administration uh, keep, t right. keep touting. We need 3%. We need 3%. So, you know, it sounds to me like what this person you're you're not naming is trying to say is that this is this is going to work and that people are going to start feeling better as a result of this. Now, Democrats could could employ the insights of MMT and say, because we understand that we have a sovereign currency mm -hmm. and that we are not like a business and we're not on a gold standard, that we can better fund education and infrastructure and R&D and we can do programs that Democrats like and we can improve the growth of the economy, employment and all those things. So MMT can be deployed for good or evil, so to speak. Um, but it's an interesting question. You know, I'm not entirely convinced that he's wrong in the sense that, um, you know, every tax cut is going to increase somebody's disposable income, mm -hmm. right? So it's true that these tax cuts are disproportionately favor those at the very top. Right. No question about that, right? But when the Joint Committee on Taxation, one of the, one of the scorekeeping agencies in D.C., looked at the Republican tax cuts, they said, in every decile of the income distribution, people will on average see higher take home pay. Whether you're mm -hmm. in the bottom 10% or the top 10% or any 10% in between, there's gonna be an average, uh, on average, people are gonna take home more money. Right. Now those at the very top take home a lot more and those at the very bottom take home a little bit more. You might've seen, uh, I'm sure you did, the, uh, the Paul Ryan deleted tweet about yes. the um, right? fifty, <laughs> about, about fifty, right? About fifty uh, or whatever. But you know, people are going to notice something, and how much they notice, and how much better it makes them feel. And then, on the other hand, how much do their healthcare premiums go up? How much do the loss of other deductions and so forth hurt them? On balance, I don't know what's going to happen, but 
I'm a little concerned, to be perfectly honest, about um, 2018, if Democrats are have convinced themselves that these tax cuts are going to be so disastrous for the middle class and for those at the bottom mm -hmm. that they can run against them and count on that being a really powerful message for them in 2018. You know, the, they're saying that this isn't actually tax cuts, that this, the Republicans are raising taxes mm -hmm. on the majority of people. That's true if the tax cuts don't expire in seven years. Right. But for the next four, five, six years, you've got tax cuts in place. So it'll be interesting to see how much of that additional windfall gets spent into the economy, how much more that creates additional demand and employment. And, mm -hmm. you know, I... I think you're, it's not unreasonable to think that we could see 3% growth. Wow. Yeah. Um, as, we, as we gear up for, for the next election, and say, say you were the chairwoman of the Federal Reserve, um, and you were advising uh, our, our government and our, you know, our president, say it was Bernie Sanders, I'm just going to create a situation here. Um, this is, there's a lot here. You know, we're, income inequality, as you know, is, is higher than it's been in, in almost 100 years. Where do you start? And, and is it even possible to reverse, to, to create a new deal in this era, to reverse the oligarchs investing in every single corner of every major city of this country and the economy? Yeah, I think it is possible to reverse it. And I think that that is a battle that has to be waged on so many fronts, everything from antitrust mm -hmm. to, um, you know, a federal job guarantee. You mentioned uh, New Deal. Mm -hmm. So FDR's second Bill of Rights. I mean, go back to kind of what did what did FDR do? This is a man who was elected president four times. Mm -hmm. And the unfinished business of the Democratic Party under FDR was that second Bill of Rights that he laid out and left on the table, but that never became. Uh, never became fully uh, implemented, you know, and the first thing that FDR talked about in the second Bill of Rights was a right to a job. Mm. Uh, and we don't have that still today. And that's a game changing sort of policy. So if you begin to see people pushing big, ambitious things like taking very seriously antitrust, once again, in this country, mm -hmm. and a federal job guarantee program, and a right to an education and a right to health care and a fundamental just reshaping of industries uh, across the country, then you're and, and campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, such a multi front um, battle that has to take place. But if we don't, if we don't do it, we're going to lose the country. It's a bright note to end on. <laughs> Oh, are we done? <laughs> I would have finished differently. Okay, give us some hope. <laughs> oh, no, it's funny because you said as, as chairman of the Federal Reserve, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that would sort of violate customs and norms to have the chairman of the Federal Reserve sit down with the president That's and true. say, here's what we need to do. Yes. However, uh, it's a conversation that, that you, you do need that as a partner. I mean, the Fed would play an important role in that, mostly in the regulatory and supervisory of the large financial institutions. Yeah. Stephanie Kelton, thank you so much. I feel like thank we you. could go on for like an hour and a half. Like we just, we just skimmed the surface, but appreciate Thanks the so work much. that you're doing. If you liked this interview and you're at the end, so apparently you liked it a little bit, thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. You can watch them live as they happen if you're a member. Only members get that. Go to tytnetwork.com slash join and you get not only interviews live, you get the Young Turks live, you get Aggressive Progressive live, old school, and all of it commercial free. Come join us right now, tytnetwork.com slash join.